Hello, everyone. Today, I'd like to discuss my favorite topic, anti-consumerism. Watch my video till the end, and you'll learn why critics of frugal living will never become richer. And if they do become rich, there's a high probability they'll end up po again. Why is saving much harder than investing? By the end of the video, you'll understand what the overall savings rate is not to be confused with the ordinary savings rate and why this parameter is crucial for any investor. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel and like this video. Thank you. Periodically, I come across articles and videos that criticize my frugality concept, and almost always, I see a lack of understanding about the investment process. Let me share one of those quotes. You've been talking extensively about frugality, creating the impression that it's the most important thing, but it's the tenth item on the list compared to the ability to earn a lot. Or here's another example. He keeps telling everyone to save on everything, but he made his money in business. On the surface, these arguments seem logical, but only at first glance. Colleagues, frugality is not the tenth most important factor, it's at least the second and possibly the first. I will try to explain why my opponents are mistaken, or rather, why they fail to see the whole picture. First, let me provide a crash course for those who are watching my videos for the first time. You cannot build wealth solely through the stock market. The stock market is simply not designed for that purpose. Capital must be earned outside of it, solely through serving society. There are no other ways. Well, technically there are. But any attempts to take a shortcut almost always lead to disaster. If you're watching channels about financial literacy, chances are you want to become wealthy. The formula for wealth boils down to a simple question you should ask yourself. How many people do I serve? How many people do I help? Not your employer, but you personally. If you're only concerned about yourself right now, you will always be very po. If you care about dozens or hundreds of people, you will soon become part of the middle class. However, if you care about thousands, tens of thousands, or even hundreds of thousands, then you are destined for wealth. We can see that I did not mention the word thrift when talking about wealth. And indeed, there is no benefit to humanity in saving money on a cappuccino. We will not earn millions by scrimping on a cup of coffee at the nearest cafe. So why all this fuss? Thrift, in my opinion, is necessary so that we don't pour water from a hose into a leaky barrel. Thrift is needed for acceleration. The thought that the process of accumulation can take 25 to 30 years, as they tell us in textbooks, does not please us. We are not pleased by that. Thrift is also needed to deceive the brain. It is very difficult for us to fight the habits that were instilled in us during childhood. And it is very difficult for us to fight our nature. For example, our instincts. That very thrift, which my colleagues look at with disdain, and some even with arrogance, allows us to tame our inner monkey. I am surrounded by people who already know how to earn a lot, or indecently much. But they haven't learned how to spend. As a result, they are still po. They present dozens of arguments against thrift, but they are afraid of the main thing showing their bank account, showing the amount in their brokerage account, showing the contents of their safety deposit box, because it is often empty or very little compared to how much they earn. Thrift serves as a patch for a leaky barrel or a leaky bucket. This is not all. In the process of accumulation, we will need to master not just one skill, but two. The first skill is how to become wealthy, and the second skill is how to stay wealthy. I emphasize that these are two fundamentally different abilities, and frugality is needed in both cases. Frugality helps us to accumulate wealth multiple times faster. I will prove this with numbers at the end of the video. Moreover, frugality allows us not to become impoverished. Next thought personally, I believe that earning money is not that difficult. It involves a set of practical skills, the right direction, time, and a bit of luck. However, learning to spend money correctly is a much more challenging self-improvement task because it literally requires us to reshape ourselves and change our personality. And that is difficult. Why is it difficult? I will explain with examples. Where does wastefulness actually come from? One reason is an attempt to heal childhood wounds. 
There is even a term for it revenge spending when we try to compensate for a difficult childhood, so to speak. Let me quote Robert Quillen from the Washington Post, 1927, on the eve of the Great Depression, the harder you had it in times of poverty, the more you will enjoy flaunting your wealth. End of quote. Nothing has changed since then, and it is unlikely to change in the coming years because our nature does not change quickly. It takes thousands of years to change human nature. For example, we encountered revenge spending after the well-known lockdowns of 2020. People were confined to their homes and then broke free and started spending as if they had lost their minds, completely forgetting about their future. Another hole in our wallet is our needs. For example, love. The problem is not the need itself. Everyone has more or less the same needs, and it is impossible to eliminate a need. The problem is that we satisfy our needs in a misguided way. Let me explain with an example. Have you ever wondered why many people dream of buying an expensive car? What do people think when they see the driver of a brand new Tesla or Lamborghini? Wow, this guy in the car is cool. No, they are not thinking about that. They think something like this. If I had such a car, people would think I'm cool. Marketers promoting premium cars were quick to realize this characteristic. You won't see faces in their advertisements. Only silhouettes, contours of your future self, your future you. With the help of external attributes, we try to show others that they should love and respect us. But it doesn't increase our love, because our wealth serves as nothing more than a reference point for other people's desire to be loved. That's all. What's the way out here? Fulfill the need for love directly. You can learn this in two to three sessions with a psychotherapist. The cost is minimal, and it's definitely cheaper than foolish spending on cars. Next thought, why do I think it's very difficult to fight against our nature? Here's another example. I really love the sauna I visit it two to three times a week, usually after a workout. My fitness club is expensive, and the people who go there are not po. Recently, I caught myself thinking that 9 out of 10 men in the sauna have a weight problem, bellies, etc. I constantly struggle with this problem too, and it's a very difficult fight. It's hard for overweight people, very difficult to lose weight. It's even harder for them to stay in shape. I know this from personal experience. On one hand, it's a simple task everything has already been figured out. It has been written down, algorithms have been described. We need to read about insulin resistance, get tests done, learn about the keto diet, implement intermittent fasting, and add some exercise. And then you will see on the scale, there, minus 20, there, 15 kilograms plus or minus. On the other hand, why is it that the Forbes top is full of fat people? Very intelligent, but fat. That means they have diabetes, heart problems, etc. And that means they are poor in terms of health. And in my fitness club, the majority of men are fat. They're wealthy, smart, but fat. They have a lot of money. Almost everyone can afford a personal dietitian. But to do that, you have to change what was ingrained in us since childhood. Continuing the analogy with nutrition, the problem of obesity worldwide is due to incorrect food in the diet. Primarily, a massive amount of carbohydrates and sugars. Sugar is a drug, scarier than synthetics and opiates. An overweight person is essentially a sugar addict. And he's an addict who doesn't realize he's sick. When you start explaining to a sugar addict that he'll have to give up certain foods for the rest of his life, he starts to get angry. What will I eat? What about spaghetti? What do you mean give up alcohol forever? How will I live without my favorite desserts? What? Fat people can't eat fruit. What nonsense. Someone even tries to build a solid foundation, a whole theory, because they're attacking something sacred. Our fat person presents arguments, solid arguments, but they still weigh 100 plus kilograms and have a waist of 110 centimeters. What does this resemble, colleagues? It's exactly like the world of finance. The same set of arguments. You only live once. You need to earn more. I can afford it. Now let's get back to the key question of investing the question why. I believe that becoming an investor without the ability to save is impossible. Why do we invest? To become richer. Why do we want to become rich? 
to fulfill certain needs. What is wealth? Is it the number of zeros in your bank account? No. Is it the number of cars in your garage? No, not that either. Maybe it's being on Forbes list. No again. Earlier, I mentioned that, for me personally, the highest form of wealth is the ability to do what I want at any given moment, rather than what others tell me to do. Many affluent individuals, politicians, sports stars, entertainers, and prominent businessmen lack this privilege. They may have more money than I do, but they have zero control over their time. I doubt any of you enjoy it when life dictates the rules to you, even if they are somewhat desirable. Being in control of our own lives makes us happy. And control is the main dividend I receive every day. That's the answer to the question, why? Frugality is primarily important to me for control, not for accumulating millions. Now, let's gradually move from poetic expressions to facts and figures. First, I'll try to address the most common arguments against the need for saving and provide counter-arguments. The first argument, I enjoy indulging in purchases. I reward myself for hard work. I also love my job. I want to work until the end of my life. I don't need an early retirement. Colleagues, I loved my job too, but I didn't enjoy doing my favorite work according to a schedule I couldn't control. Do you like doing your favorite work for 14 hours a day without weekends, 365 days a year? I don't. I, like you, enjoy spending money. I really do. But I don't want to sacrifice my health or waste time just to maintain a high level of consumption. That's simply foolish. Every saved druble represents my future, my time, my freedom. I want to buy time, expand it, and make it more fulfilling. Here's another strange argument. What if we all become frugal at once start pinching pennies? The economy will definitely collapse. Our wives will cut our hair at home, and barbers won't get paid. They won't spend money on coffee. Cafe owners won't get paid, and they won't spend money on going to the movies, for example. Firstly, this slogan reminds me of environmentalists trying to change the climate by restricting cows from naturally releasing gas. We all know that environmentalism has been purely a political tool for the past 30 years. Only one out of a hundred environmentalists actually cares about the planet's health. The rest are just accumulating political points. Let's not base our arguments on such slogans. They won't earn us any political points. Secondly, proponents of this argument don't quite understand what frugality means. Frugality is an equation. The difference between income and expenses, not just some saved rubles. So, if I earned a million and spent 300,000, saving 700,000, that's frugality too. From an economic perspective, it's an impressive figure. But if we consider it in absolute values, it turns out I spend an indecent amount, much more than the average person statistically. So, the economy won't collapse because of me. Quite the opposite, perhaps. The next set of arguments. Saving makes us bow. Saving demotivates us. That's an incorrect thesis. The opponent using this argument most likely hasn't yet become the owner of substantial capital. The consumption structure and spending patterns of investors who have managed to accumulate a substantial amount with whom I have spoken undergo a complete transformation, and their motivation doesn't go away. People don't stop wanting things. It's just that wealthy individuals start wanting something different. Here's another example. Recently, I had a conversation with my spouse. She is also an investor, not in need, and her capital has surpassed 10 million rubles. She made a remark worth noting, and I quote, You know, lately, I hardly feel the urge to go shopping for clothes. I prefer directing surplus money towards creation, for the greater good, for my own projects. And the more I channel there, surprisingly, the faster my nest egg grows. It's amazing. End of quote. In reality, there's nothing astonishing about it. We have already discussed this. Here's a tangible example of saving and extraordinary motivation. Now, as promised, let's move from facts to figures. Do you remember when I told you that nothing is more important in investments than the savings rate? What is the savings rate? It is the difference between income and expenses. What is the formula comprised of? 
it includes the ability to earn primarily through business and career advancement and the ability to save. Everything else is secondary. The choice of stocks is secondary. The choice of asset classes is secondary. Market timing is secondary. And even compound interest is also secondary. Let me tell you something else. This information is crucial and has never been mentioned on YouTube. Let's start with something more fundamental. You have probably already heard about the rule of 72. It demonstrates how much time it takes to double your capital. Take the number 72 divided by our expected annual return and you will get the number of years required to double your capital. The rule of 72 has one significant drawback. It predicts the doubling of your current capital as single investment, but that's not how we invest. We regularly add to our accounts. We need to account for new contributions and accumulated savings. In other words, how much we already have. For this purpose, we need to introduce the concept of the overall savings rate. The regular savings rate is the ratio of saved money to your current income, right? And the overall savings rate is the amount of saved money relative to your capital, how much you have already accumulated. Let's say your capital is 1 million and you want to add 200,000 to it next year. Your overall savings rate will be 20%. The overall savings rate equals the expected annual growth divided by the total capital. The general savings rate is the expected annual increase divided by the total capital. Why is the general savings rate important? Because it indicates the areas where pressure needs to be applied in order to grow faster. First conclusion. Increasing the general savings rate is much more important, far more important than profitability. Increasing the general savings rate is more important than increasing returns by a couple of percentage points. Taking risks should be done outside of the stock market in order to increase the general savings rate. Saving is more important than investing, surprisingly enough, especially for beginners. And the general savings rate is more important than compound interest, especially in the first 15th October 2020 years of investing. Now I will allow myself to criticize channels on financial literacy. I rarely do this, but there is a need for it now. I believe that my colleagues are engaged in anything but discussing truly important matters. Some individuals delve into fundamental analysis, forgetting to check what their salary is in the first place, why it hasn't been increasing for a couple of years, and how much money they have managed to save this month. Simple questions, right? Others argue endlessly about what's better, a dividend strategy, investment strategies, or passive investment strategies, without realizing that an investor with a billion rubles in their account will be incomparably richer than 99% of their colleagues, even if they choose stocks randomly. Some try to predict entry points, constantly forgetting that they haven't really accumulated anything yet. Maybe they have only 300,000 rubles in their account, I don't know. The fourth group talks about giant profits in the stock market, failing to mention that they earned all their money from something else, most likely from the same societal benefit we discussed earlier. And most of my colleagues still ignore a key factor in investing, the ability to save, the ability to put money aside. From this, another important thing follows. I increasingly come to the conclusion that the stock market is simply a means of transportation. The stock market is a way to deliver your excesses into the future, nothing more. The stock market through the eyes of an amateur is like a money tree where coins and banknotes grow, right? And a professional sees the stock market as a set, you know, some of their packages will arrive, some will get lost along the way, and that's normal. The most important thing is to send packages in the first place. It's also important to send them more frequently so that the packages are larger. In conclusion, I will share a comment from one of the subscribers. Just as I increased my savings rate, the general savings rate came and demotivated me. After all, with capital growth and maintaining the income level, the general savings rate will tend towards zero, if I understood correctly. That's true, colleagues. But personally, this information does not demotivate me. Now I see that in the later stages of accumulation, I can afford to relax a little. For example, 
I don't have to pick stocks or guess which asset classes will perform well and which won't. I'm not concerned about that. I won't argue with colleagues about strategies. And most importantly, I won't restrict myself to the point of becoming pale in my expenses. I will finally start spending. And it doesn't necessarily have to be on consumer goods. It can be on creation as well. We have already figured that out. Subscribe to the channel. Like the videos to not miss out on new helpful content. Be sure to share your opinion in the comments.